Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning, June 12th, here at Reformed Presbyterian Church. It's good to see all of you with us. Just a couple of notes before we get going. I know we have a lot of visitors today. Uh, There is no nursery today. We uh, obviously people want to be in here today, so there's no one to staff the nursery. If you want to use the nursery, you're still welcome to do that, but nobody is staffing it. We also have a family room in the back. You can go outside the sanctuary to the right, up the stairs and to the right again. Actually, very nice seats. You can hear everything, uh, but uh, we won't be able to hear you. So if you have um, some wigglers and some um, talkers, uh, you, can, you can go use the family room. We also have a bookshelf here in the back with uh, some activities for little children if you would like to utilize that. But we do gather this morning to worship the risen Lord. And so let's begin that worship with a responsive reading from Philippians chapter 2. Jesus Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray together. We pray to you, God the Father. We do pray that every knee would bow. We pray that here in this room this morning we would indeed worship you, that we would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord that we would be moved to obedience and love. We ask this in his name. Amen.
seated. What a way to go out to be able to have a baptism. Um, so if you want to come up up front now, you can sit down here. I'm going to say a few words. And um, But uh, Isaac Martin, who was just born two and a half, three weeks ago today, uh, we're going to have his baptism this morning. Uh, Christina and Dustin had, uh, I talked to them. I, I wasn't able to baptize Eliana. And uh, they said, would you be able to like do a baptism? I'm like, well, when are you due? And you were due like, what, the 28th? So you were early. Did you, were you induced? Okay, okay. I meant, I, that was a joke, like, <laughs> you really wanted me to do this baptism, right? <laughs> so, but we were talking about it, like, okay, well, I'll, I will be flexible, and, uh, you know, we'll, it will be a privilege to have my last Sunday to, to do that. Um, it's interesting, I have, uh, I'll introduce some folks uh, when we get to the uh, greeting time, but the first person that I ever baptized is here today, and I won't embarrass her right now, but um, that is really neat. It was like, I don't know, December 18th, or there's, I, I don't know why, I, it may, maybe not that date, but it was in December, right? March. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's really sweet. Um, and for a pastor, that, that means a great deal. But I do want to say, um, it's, it's sort of unavoidable that, that um, the very thing I don't want us to do is going to happen today. You're thinking about, this is my last Sunday, and this is a relationship. So that's okay. Okay, that's okay. But, um, but this service is just as much about Jesus. And we need to remember that. And um, as we... As I baptize Isaac today, there isn't any. Th Isaac's not going to be better off because I did the baptism, um, and he's not going to be better off because it was effort of water as opposed to some other water. Um, uh, this baptism is done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit sent by the Son that that uh, makes the, this baptism efficacious. And, um, and so we look to Jesus. Um, we look to Jesus to come into Isaac's life. And the amazing thing is, is that he's already, is this his third Sunday or second Sunday? He's already hanging out with Jesus. I mean, he is. He's, he's, and that's part of what this baptism is, is that it's, it's, it's saying, um, and these are what the signs of God through the Old Testament and the New have always said, is, is that the children of those of, of believing parents, even if just one parent is a believer, um, that they're worthy of receiving the sign because God includes them in the visible church, Right? It's not like they're outside the church and maybe someday they'll come in. No, they're right here now. And that's significant because he's surrounded by grace. In your home, your own nuclear family, but in the church family as well. Um, this baptism does not uh, allow Isaac to somehow become a believer in a miraculous way on this occasion. Uh, this is like an engagement ring that looks forward to um, Isaac being a part of the Bride of Christ. And we look forward to that day. So Kevin and I are going to come down, and Kevin's going to do the vows. So. Right. 
we have a few vows for the parents to answer. These are important questions, especially on an occasion like this, to profess your faith in front of the family of God. So Dustin and Christina, do you acknowledge your children's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on their behalf, and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as you do for your own? Do you now unreservedly dedicate your children to God and promise, in humble reliance upon divine grace, that you will endeavor to set before them a godly example, that you will pray with and for them, that you will teach them the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Now I have a question for the congregation, the members of this church. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of these children? Let's, uh, let's stand at this time as we continue in our worship.
this is a two-part reading. So I have the first part, you have the second. Okay? Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings.
be seated for just a moment, please. A lot of pastors, when they get to this point, and they've told me, they said, well, I, I just really miss uh, being able to preach, and I miss the pulpit, and I'm sure that that, that will happen. Um, I don't think it's going to happen next Sunday. Um, uh, but what I'm going to miss is your worship. That's what I'll miss. You're, you're a great singing congregation. You really are. We don't, we don't need a choir. Uh, you're the choir. Um, but I, I, I will miss... Um, and and it's, a, it's a privilege to be up front. It's kind of cool now that pastors aren't up front. It's just a music team. Um, that's what some churches do. But we don't do it that way. It's, it's not a moral issue. But it is a joy to be with you as God's people. And, and for me, that's a, just a taste of what's ahead for all of us. I was looking around at some of your faces. And, and, uh, and there's some faces that are missing. People I love dearly are not here, but but they're doing something like this that's like awesome on steroids in comparison to to this. They're okay, and um, anyway, I'm gonna miss that. Before we greet one another, I just wanted to do some introductions. I wasn't planning on it, but I uh, seeing some folks who are here that I didn't know were gonna be here. I'm gonna do that anyway. My, my family's up front here, and even though they grew up in this church, uh, that was a long time ago, so I'm going to reintroduce them uh, to you. My oldest son, Tom, can you stand, Tom? And Stephanie, his wonderful wife. And there are three boys, TJ and Elliot and Benji. Um, Thank you. Uh, my middle daughter, uh, Katie, if you could stand, and her husband, Joe. And there's Callie, our granddaughter. And um, yeah, it's great having you here today. And uh, then Amy and Andrew, uh, if you can stand. Only about to make it here. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Amy and Andrew are, they live in the uh, Chicago area, Tom, and you can, you can sit down now, Andrew. <laughs> Amy and Andrew live in the Chicago area, Tom and Steph are, that's why we go down to Richmond um, to see them. And uh, Katie and Joe are over near Phoenixville. Um, and so it's, it's been nice having some family that's uh, close by. There are some others who are here today, too. Um, the uh, Johnson family, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have you stand, Janet and George and Shannon and your beautiful daughter, right? Um, uh, Janet was my second office administrator at, at uh, EPC in Baltimore. So uh, keep her away from Nancy and Debbie. Uh, I don't want any uh, stories being shared. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, Steve and, and Cheryl Hansen, can you guys stand up um, from our, our church? And, um, and then uh, Patrick and Sarah. Uh, Sarah is uh, Steve's daughter. Um, I baptized both of these folks and had a part in their wedding several years ago. Um, and uh, then Max and Donna Arms, if you can stand up. Um, Max's father was the pastor of the church, and he retired just prior to my taking the pastorate in Baltimore. Um, he's, if, if you know anything about the old RPCES, the Arms family is like a, that's a famous name in our church history. Um, and then uh, uh, Ethan and Emily, Ethan and Emily, can you stand up? Uh, thank you for being here today. 
and Charlotte. Yes, there's Charlotte. Yeah. Ethan is Max and Donna's son, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, marrying them. Uh, has it been two years now? Two years in July. Okay. Do you know I got a speeding ticket on the way down to your wedding? <laughs> That's sort of a joke from the bank when people were talking about what a bad driver I am. So. But anyway, it, I, I probably missed somebody. There are people who are back, um, and we're so glad to see you. Did, did I miss anybody else where I just haven't seen? Oh, <laughs> Andrew Hansen. Andrew, I'm sorry. You're, you're both wearing the same outfits. You're in bathrooms. <laughs> I miss you. And Andrew is uh, Sarah's uh, brother and Steve's daughter. So thank you so much for being here. Could you, could you take a moment at this time just to stand and to greet each other? Well, welcome once again to our worship service this morning. Um, Tom and I prayed before the service, as we always do, and Tom's prayer was that this would be glorifying to the Lord. Um, but we're going to take just one moment, another moment, actually, to be indulgent here to Tom. So if you're wearing any sort of Philadelphia sports paraphernalia, just stand up and let Tom just take that in for a minute. <laughs> the offertory going to be Fly Eagles Fly? <laughs> I want you to know I wore all of my Philadelphia sports paraphernalia this morning. <laughs> so the ushers have already come forward and passed out the attendance registers. Uh, if you would be so kind as to sign in, it would be great to have a record of everyone who is in attendance this morning. Again, welcome to our worship service. If you're visiting with us today, you've walked in on quite a day as you probably already gathered, as we uh, say goodbye to our pastor of 28 years. Let's go before the Lord together at this time in a word of prayer. Oh Lord, our God, there are many uh, emotions today. It's a, it's a day of celebration. It's a day of worship. It's a day of thanks. It's also a day of farewells. But Lord, we're thankful that you have been faithful to us for so long, for many years so many in this room can give testimony to your greatness and your faithfulness and your kindness. And as we have sung, that you will hold us fast through all seasons of life. We're grateful for your faithfulness to Tom and his family, that you have sustained him for as long as you have, and that you have blessed him as well. And Lord, we want to pray for Tom this morning as he retires from this call. 
We want to pray for his peace and for his comfort and for his rest. But Lord, we know that though he is retiring from this call as pastor of this church, he is not retiring from being a servant of God, from being a husband, a father, a grandfather, a neighbor, a friend. And to those ministries, may you magnify his work. May you magnify the fruit. May he take great joy in the work that you have done in and through him for so long. And may he look ahead with great joy and anticipation of the good works that you still have set before him. We thank you for his ministry. And we give thanks to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, the ushers are coming forward again to collect our offering.
this is an eagle's tie. You can't really see it, but I asked Linda to bring it because I saw all these people in uniform. But I want you to be kind to my Baltimore friends, okay? <laughs> There's some Raven fans, serious Raven fans here, and we have some serious Steelers fans here. Most of them say Stillers, not Steelers. Um, so we're a blended congregation. Uh, the scripture reading this morning is uh, from Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> First 11 verses, if you don't have that, it is uh, written out for you in the, in the bulletin and it's, it's up here as well. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints... In Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you'll be able to discern what is best and you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. This is God's word to us today. I forgot my watch today, not that that ever mattered <laughs> for the last 38 years. Um, so, but I can do whatever I want, you know? <laughs> so, um, just to, as, I, as I begin this morning, I thank you for the banquet on Friday. Uh, that was uh, j just incredibly meaningful to both to me and to Linda. Thank you for honoring her. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there were things that were said and, and that's just, I'm just gonna be kind of mulling on that, savoring that uh, for quite a while. Um, I'll, I'll cherish those words. Uh, secondly, I, I, as, as I start, I, I don't really know how to say goodbye, okay? And I'm probably not very good at it, there wasn't any class in seminary about, okay, now this is what you do on your last Sunday at a pastor. Fortunately, I've only had to do this twice. Um, sometimes we can put pressure on ourselves as ministers for special occasions. Like, I always felt like on Easter, it has to be the best sermon I've ever preached, you know. Um, and actually, Easter kind of preaches itself. And, or Christmas Eve or something when all the family's in. And I'm like, oh, well, I have to have a really good sermon because my family's here. You know, there's pressures we put on ourselves that we have to deal with. Those are my problems, not yours. Um, and for an occasion like this, I also feel uh, that way. But uh, it's just going to be regular old me. Um, and we're going to be looking at what God's word is saying to us. I saw a cartoon early in my ministry. I was in my office in Baltimore and I was reading uh, Leadership Magazine, which is put out by Christianity Today. And um, there is a picture in a cartoon of uh, a pastor sitting in his office at his desk looking very anguished and maybe a tad angry. And over on the opposite wall from his desk were like five filing cabinets. 
And they were all labeled nice and neat. And, but the bottom left drawer of the far left filing cabinet was full and stuffed and overflowing. You couldn't have possibly closed that drawer. And on that filing cabinet, it said, sermons I will preach on my last Sunday. Um, there's probably been some sermons I've preached to myself that I'm glad I never preached to you. <laughs> um, but I, I don't have anything like that. Um, but I found myself back in Philippians, which has always been a, a favorite book of mine, and, and, and I'm not the first uh, pastor to, to say something like that. Um, uh, over the last, you know, couple months, the closer I was getting to June 12th, the more I would see what hasn't been finished yet, um, what's unfinished. And it could just be like little things or things that have suddenly occur to you like, well, I never got to that. Um, and I was, I've been thinking about that, um, as I was getting ready for today. Um, I could never finish you. I, I'm completely incapable of finishing you. Um, I have no control over that, but Jesus will. That's, that's why I'm a pastor, because he will, and, and I need to tell you that he's the one who finishes what he starts. I can't finish you as a church. Um, if you're finished, then it almost sounds like we're done, right? But I can't, I can't complete you because a church is an organism. It's not just an organization. It's a living organism of people, and churches morph. You know, you don't notice it because you go day by day, but you can look at how the church just... It goes through this phase, and it goes through that, and we have these people here, and then we have those people there, and since I've been here, there's a, a generation of leaders in this church that many of you don't know, and they're with Christ as I speak. But I could never complete RPC, um, but I'm confident that Jesus can. And Paul, <clears throat> Paul expresses that... Uh, confidence in the passage that we're looking at and the setting for Paul is that he's in prison we don't know which prison most people think he's in Rome and even though he says I think I'm going to see you guys again I can't wait to see you if he's in Rome he never sees them again okay other people think he's in Ephesus where there was some really steep persecution um, you might remember from the book of Acts that in our study that he was there for three years doing ministry. Um, and out of that came church plants throughout Asia, what we know as Turkey today. It was his main base, but he was in, he was in prison there. And some think he's, he's writing from, uh, from that perspective. But what I was realizing was that he was completely helpless to really do anything else to what really is his favorite church. It was the first church planted in Europe. He was going to go down to Asia, to Ephesus, and remember the man from Macedonia in his vision said, go to Greece. So it's the first church in Asia. And he has this special relationship with them. And yet he's in prison, and he realizes that his ability to sort of continue as their pastor is... That phase is over, okay? So I think part of, that's part of what resonated with me as I came to this passage. Um, primarily, this, uh, what stands out to me in the passage is um, his confidence that God will finish his work. At the end of my message, there's some more personal things he says, and I want to say those to you as well. Let me ask you this. How many of you right now have some kind of unfinished project going on at your house. Yeah, I mean, we all do. And, you know, we've been through a pandemic and you've all been home and, and you still haven't finished your projects yet, right? But it could be anything. It could be construction. It could be that wall you, you, you've wanted to, 
you know, paint and you just haven't gotten to it and it stares at you, you know, every day that you, you go in the house. Um, maybe it's a landscaping project or maybe there's just some things you just want to go and fix. Believe me, I have a list of things that, you know, when I realized, okay, I am going to retire, then I started making this list. And it was almost an excuse. <laughs> I'll do that when I retire. <laughs> So I have a lot of unfinished things. When my mom died, and actually before that, when they moved to Moravian Manor from the Willow Grove area, she, you know, my mom had a disability. Um, she could, had multiple sclerosis, couldn't walk. And, uh, but she did a lot of stuff with her hands while she was able. So she had all these, all these projects. And um, she was an avid knitter. She could knit anything, but she had all these other things. And I remember going through what used to be my bedroom, and, and it, it was just, like, filled with a lot of unfinished, you know. And isn't that how life is? That there's, we always have things, and if you're younger, you need to know this. You always have things in front of you that are unfinished. I mean, you can finish your school year and say, okay, now I'm finished with ninth grade. I'm going into 10th grade. We have those kinds of moments of closure. But there are so many things that we feel are left undone. And one of those things is we feel like I'm not finished. Like God isn't finished with me yet. Okay? And as I, as I retire as your pastor and that relationship comes to an end, um, I feel unfinished as just as a believer that God has so much more work to do in my life now uh, that hasn't been yet. And, and sometimes you might not understand this. I think sometimes the focus of ministry, and it's a problem for every pastor, the focus of ministry is so much on other people that we need to pay more attention to our own souls and our own spiritual health, or we can't even do our job. You could be a really, really good plumber and worship Satan, you know? But you can't be a good pastor <laughs> unless you walk with God. So one thing you can pray for me, and this is actually for the end of my sermon, but you can just pray for my walk with God. Um, Pray for my growth in God. And Kevin, such a beautiful prayer, what you prayed. Thank you. Because um, I need that. Um, here's the thing about how we're different than God. Uh, we, we start projects and get distracted because we find something more inter interesting. Or we start a project and we realize that we're in over our head and we don't know what to do. Um, sometimes we, we start things and uh, we just get discouraged. Or maybe we get bored. But God is not like us in that he never gets distracted when it comes to you and to me. Um, there is never something else that's more important to him. Do you realize that? There is never something else that's more important to him than you as his children. Um, he doesn't get bored with us. And amazingly, he doesn't get discouraged, although we can grieve his heart. He never started a work in someone's life and then said to himself, you know, this is a little bit more than I bargained for. God doesn't have those kinds of problems. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say this, that when we talk about God finishing things, we, we have to remember that the basis of that is that there are some things he finished, and they don't have to be done again, okay? And we're talking about the cross and the resurrection. There isn't anything that needs to be added to or adjusted in any way when he said, it is finished on the cross, it was finished. And nothing more needs to be paid for. There is no debt too great 
that he cannot meet. There is nothing incomplete about uh, the work of Jesus that he came to do. That has been accomplished. Amen? Amen. Amen. So keep in mind, as we talk about God as a finisher, uh, we're not saying that um, there's something back there that needs to be finished. We're talking here primarily about the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent to do the finishing work. In construction, you know, you have people who put in foundations. Uh, some of you guys do that, and then you, 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 you build the... You put the studs on and all that. See, I know that word, studs, you know. You, know. Uh, you put the roof on, you get the drywall people in, all that. And then there's these guys who come in and they're finishers. They do the detail stuff. They do the stuff that um, a lot of builders just hate. You know, they don't care about the details. Just get the house up and move on to the next one. The finishers come in and, and, they, and they make it what it's supposed to be, you know. Um, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So uh, um, Paul begins this letter just by giving a word of hope and confidence that each of us that can count on, that, that whatever we think of our life, wherever we are right now, whatever happened last week or last month or last year, that the, the Lord Jesus is going to bring you to completion. You as an individual and you as a congregation, he will do his work. And Paul's sitting in a prison cell, unable to really touch the Philippians other than through this letter. And he's saying, I am, I am so confident of that. And I'm confident of that with you as a, as a congregation. I want to begin a good work in you. Donna, I don't know how this came into my mind. Donna Arms, where, where's Donna? She's, oh, she's up there. Can you hear me, Donna? Oh, there she is, okay. Donna, do you, Donna was our VBS director down in Baltimore. We had a pretty small church, but we have like, we'd have like 120 kids for a week. Um, and I just remember... One of the songs that we used to sing, it was, uh, maybe Tom remembers, Kids Under Construction, maybe the, maybe the paint is still wet. Kids Under Construction, the Lord isn't finished with me yet, or something like that, you know? And we should think of ourselves more as in that state as a church, that we really kind of are under construction. And sometimes we need to wear hard hats because we hurt each other or offend each other. And, um, but the Lord's working on us as his people. Um, we're his project, and in that sense, um, we are his responsibility. And Paul is admitting that this church is beyond his scope, other than this letter that he is writing. Now, why is it that he can be the one who finishes you? Well, first of all, it's because he's the one who started you. Did you start yourself? Did you born yourself into this world? No. Somebody else did that. <coughs> um, you didn't start your first birth, and you didn't start your second birth. It was the Lord who began that work in you. There's a lot of well-meaning, God-fearing Christians who are my brothers and sisters in Christ, but they describe their salvation experience as something that they began on their own. It was their willpower, as if their salvation was something that they had the ability to sort of jumpstart. What's wrong with those other people? And God was just sort of this cheerleader on the sideline who sort of cooperated with my willpower to sort of, and that's how I began. But according to this verse, it says that God began the good work in us. He was the one who not only breathed life into the first Adam at creation and made him a living person, but Christ and the Holy Spirit 
are the ones who breathe new life into us. Isn't it interesting? Maybe you don't think so, but I do. Uh, that in Acts chapter 16, where we have recorded the story of when Paul came to Philippi and he met Lydia, who was praying at the riverside because uh, she was Jewish, uh, we think, uh, but there is a group of women praying there because there weren't enough men to have a synagogue. So that's why they were doing that. And Acts 16, verse 14 says that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's message. Who began the good work in Philippi? Who began the good work in Lydia? It was Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit. And that's part of why Paul is confident, even though he's in a prison cell and separated from a congregation that he loves, is that he didn't start the work in the first place. The Holy Spirit did um, through Paul's ministry. And of course, not only does, did he start the work, but Paul is implying here in Philippians 1 that he's still doing the work, that the work is still being carried out in their lives. And that's important for us to remember. Sometimes we live like Philippians 2 verse 12 where Paul says, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But we forget to read the next verse, which is, for God is at work in you to will and to act for his good pleasure. And we need to remember that as God's people. C.S. Lewis uh, said this, He says, put right out of your head the idea that Christians are to read what Christ said and then try to carry it out. As a man may read what Plato or Mark said and try to carry it out. They, the gospel writers, mean something much more than that. They mean that a real person, Christ, here and now, in that very room where you are saying your prayers, is doing things in you. And he's doing things to you, gradually turning you permanently into a different sort of thing, into a new little Christ, a being which in its own small way has the same kind of life as God, which shares in his power, joy, knowledge, and eternity. He is, continues to work in us, and we need to have that confidence, and we need to have uh, that faith. Um, We can't finish ourselves, but we worship and serve a God who's going to bring that process to its fitting uh, conclusion. And I can can, uh, depart from you in that same confidence that you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Christ. He's, he is doing that work in your lives. So Paul has that, a very well-placed confidence. Um, and I just want to say a, a couple other things. It, he has a well-placed confidence, but his affections for this church run deep. I mean, did, did you hear that when I, when I read it? Uh, I, I thank My God, every time I remember you and all my prayers for you, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. He really loves this church. And there aren't many letters where he takes the time to say how highly he thinks of them. Sometimes he jumps right into what he wants to say, but he doesn't do that with the Philippians. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart, um, God can testify how I long for you all with the affections of Christ Jesus. The word here for uh, partnership, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, is actually a financial term. And Paul uses that word purposefully. It's the word koinonia, which we translate fellowship. But it has financial implications because, the see, the Philippians 
were partners. They supported Paul in his ministry. They even sent someone to him to take care of him while he was in prison. That's what uh, chapter 2 is about. Um, I mean, what, that's, that's a deep kind of love. You know, to sit, like us sending someone, and I think we actually did this once, we sent someone over to Taiwan to help with the Yates, one of our missionaries that we support. Um, Paul had that partnership. And today, um, let me just say this, that you have been partners with me in the gospel. Um, you have supported our family. Um, now, now, you know that I've told you before that, that um, uh, we, when we give our offerings to God, we, we, we give them to the church. Um, so as I reminded uh, some of you a few years ago, like some of your tithe goes to the toilet paper and the custodial services, <laughs> you know, at the church. Some of it goes to over here for that or over here for this. But, but you have supported us through your generous giving. And we're so grateful for that. I don't have a lot of chances to say that. You have shared in my ministry. You have partnered with me. Um, and I, I, I just want to tell you that while that, that ends today, okay, that relationship ends today. Um, but we still, not in the financial sense, but we, we still partner with you in the ministry of the gospel. When we left our church in Baltimore, the congregation had no idea how much we grieved. They, they didn't. Um, I think some of them thought we just forgot about them or they had to get over the fact that you stole me from them. Um, we were talking about that the other night. Um, this, this is where God led me, but it was so hard to leave because um, we had them in our heart and they didn't know how much we still loved them. And then there were some things going on at the church where I didn't really feel like I could uh, be present in any way. Um, and that hurt even more. Um, but we longed for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. Um, one of the hardest things about moving was that that congregation, they, they loved us and they loved my kids. When we moved, they were eight, six, and four. And there was a collective memory within Evangelical Presbyterian Church. They all knew, they, they knew my kids from when they were little and they saw them grow. They knew their personalities. They knew everything. And the day we moved, we lost them. Nobody knew them. You didn't know them. The, all the memories were, you know, 70 miles south as the crow flies. And we left those memories behind. And it, it just, we, we weren't prepared for that. And, and it just broke us. There was that affection. And if you think that I'm going to just, you know, ride off into the sunset and forget about you as a congregation, I mean, no. We love you. We love you. And um, we love you in Christ. We're here together because of our commonality in Jesus and our partnership in the gospel. And we will not forget you. We need to be away for a little bit. That's just my belief about ministry. But we'll come back. You know, time to time, we'll come back and come to a worship service. Um, but you'll always be in our hearts. And while I'm no longer going to be your pastor, I'm your friend. So, and, you know, we're not, we're not moving to Hawaii or something, you know. We're, we're staying right here in effort on Tuxen Avenue, at least for now. So Paul is, has this well-placed confidence. His affections run deep, um, and, and that's completely appropriate. Um, but I just want to close with um, this prayer because Paul has a, this prayer relationship with them 
and uh, it's significant. He offers this prayer for them in verse 9, but he says in verse 19, he says, I, I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ that what's happened will turn out for my deliverance. I mean, they're praying for him, and he's, he's praying for them. And the wonderful thing is... Um, because he says, in all my prayers for you, and then he tells them what he's praying. Um, do you ever wonder sometimes, what, what do I pray about? And usually we immediately think of requests, you know, or, or needs, and who, who should I pray for? And that's, that's all good. But this prayer is a gem. Uh, you, th this, this is a prayer for a, a lifetime. Do you ever get up in the morning and you're like, I don't know what to pray? Just turn to Philippians 1.9 uh, because it's something you can pray for yourself. It's something you can pray for a friend or your spouse. It's something that you can pray for your church or for your church leaders. He says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. Right? That's what he's praying. That's what I pray for you. You're a loving congregation. I pray your love will abound more and more. I pray that you will abide by the words of 1 Corinthians 13, that you can have this in your church and you can have that in your church, but if we don't love each other, we don't have what Jesus wants in this church. Love each other. And what's amazing here, it's so countercultural. he says, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And our culture says, would say, I pray that your love would abound more and more in emotion and affection. Now, he's already said some emotional and affectionate things, but right now he's praying that we would have a love that's knowledgeable, that knows. And it's, it's an intimacy word that we know. It implies people who know each other and care for each other. You guys do this well. But also, that's wise. Love needs wisdom. You know? um, depth of insight. And then he prays for their moral discernment. He says, so that you may be able to discern what is best. And you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And if there's ever a time where you parents raising kids right now, I'm, I'm so glad that I'm not raising kids right now. You have a hard job. We live in a world where the of blurred lines. The lines are blurred. What's right? What's it's wrong? It's, I'm not talking here about Christian liberty issues of well, you know, I I drink beer and or I don't drink any alcohol at all or something like that. I'm talking here about just moral discernment, that you may discern what is best. And it has a sense here not just of what is right and wrong, but what is best through your depth, depth of, of insight so that you can be the best possible people um, before Jesus. And then he closes with this, that you may be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So that the fruit of the Spirit that comes through your relationship with Jesus would be seen and would be evident with you. I think of Psalm 1 that, you know, blessed is the one who's, you know, like a tree planted beside streams of water and it bears its fruit in its season. That's what Paul is saying here. And that's my prayer for you. Okay? And I'd like you to pray that for me. Just as a person. And Linda and I as a couple. And I'll pray for you as a, as a congregation. You should pray for this for our church. Um, and for your leaders. Um, amen? Yeah, let's pray. Father in heaven, um, uh, we pray that our love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. 
so that we might be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless at the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Extend your hands, please, to receive these words of peace. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you all. Amen. You may be seated. Just two things before we are dismissed. On the back of your bulletin, you'll see that Kingdom Kids is returning this summer for the first time in three years. Uh, the registration is uh, available now, so sign up your children, ages 4 through 12. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer to help, it's never too late to volunteer to help. You can get in touch with Alicia Weaver or the church office for that. Um, of course, as we know, this is Pastor Tom's last Sunday. Uh, there will be some refreshments out in the narthex. We just invite all of you to take some time um, to, to say a word or two to Pastor Tom uh, this, uh, this morning. So 
Uh, with that, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.